Welcome to the Social Engineer Podcast, The Doctor Is In Series. This is episode 249. I'm Chris Hadnagy, CEO and founder of Social Engineer, LLC, the Innocent Lives Foundation and the Institute for Social Engineering. I forgot what I do for a living for just one second. Um, yeah, that's how it goes. Anyway, it's a, it's a Monday, I think. Is it a Monday? It's a Monday. Anyhow, uh, this episode is, as always, this series has to have a doctor, which I am not. Well, I mean, I have my PhD in stupidity, but besides that, we have a real doctor here. Dr. Abby Morono is with me as my co-host of this series. How are you doing, Abby? I'm good, Chris. Uh, I'm Dr. Abby Morono. I'm the director of education at Social Engineer. That's where we work. <laughs> a behavior scientist. Yeah. I'm gl- Thank you for reminding everyone because I forget often. You're welcome. And, and just in case you all forgot by now, because we both forgot, um, this episode is sponsored by, uh, what is it? Oh, Social Engineer. Yes, that's it. That's the name of the company. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, if, if you are, you're, if you're a company out there and you're dealing with uh, wanting to train your employees, maybe you have a red team inside of your organization and they need to learn how to use social engineering tactics a little bit better. We have a couple really great courses coming up. We have one in Washington, D.C. that will be all about the practical application of social engineering. So we'll be doing live vishing and phishing and OSINT uh, for for that class. Then we have our foundational class, which will be later on in uh, May. That will be in Orlando. And uh, Abby and I have a nonverbal class, which I think might, uh, let me just see if we have to even say that. When is this coming out? It might be over by the time. Oh, yeah, you missed it. You missed a nonverbal class. But we're going to have more of them because we have a lot of interest yeah. in that. So we're going to do some more. That was online. Um, and we'll, we'll once once it really is over, we'll give you an update on that maybe in the next episode. And uh, there's a whole 2024 training schedule on the website. Uh, you can, of course, if you have an organization, you want some private training, you can reach out to us. We do a lot of those throughout the year. Um, and we even have some custom classes. And I'm really excited to say by the time this podcast comes out, our elicitation course will be online. Really excited about this course. It's an audio only course, and it's all about using elicitation in everyday life and a lot's focused on the negotiations and things like that. You definitely want to uh, jump on that course. We're going to do a few more of those too. And you can find out all that information on social-engineer.com. If you're interested in the topic of social engineering, you definitely need to be in our Slack channel. We have over 1,500 people in there every day talking about all aspects of social engineering, from the psychology of it. Sometimes practitioners are in there talking about the work that they do. We're helping out with pretext. We're giving reading material. There's even a job board where over a dozen people have found jobs because companies come in and post. People who are looking are in there, and a match is made. So if you're interested in a family-friendly and legal chat about social engineering, that's us. You can find the link in the show notes. And if you can't see it or if it doesn't work, just ping Abby or I on LinkedIn. We'll be more than happy to get you the most current link. And for everyone who's listening, I invite you to go check out innocentlivesfoundation.org. Uh, that organization, if you're not familiar with it, it's a nonprofit organization that for the last six and a half years has been helping law enforcement around the globe geolocate and track people who traffic children and create child abuse material. It's a, an organization that both Abby and I volunteer for. And we spend our time in different areas. Abby writes columns over there to help people deal with some of the emotions and, and the feelings that they have if they're victims of, of these horrible crimes. Also, some really great topics uh, for parents. Uh, we have some exciting things coming out that Abby's been working on for ILF. And I get to work uh, with the team that helps uh, find the predators and being able to locate them and hand them over to law enforcement. Uh, if you want to support us, you can do that multiple ways. If you have some skills that you want to you want to donate to us, like marketing, fundraising, you're good at OSINT, you can, you can reach out to us and tell us what you want to do to volunteer. And of course, as a nonprofit, we need donations. So if you want to help support the mission, you can do that monetarily. All of that and the information is on innocentlivesfoundation.org. And if you like the music that's part of this podcast, it is none other than the best rock and roll band on the planet Earth, maybe in the universe, Clutch. Um, for the last 30 years, I've been a fan of them and they're awesome. And one little side note, in case you've never listened to this podcast before, uh, Neil Fallon, the lead singer of that, helped me start the ILF six and a half years ago. He's a pretty awesome guy, and the music is great. So if you want to really check them out, go do it live. They're always on tour. Okay, last but not least, before we get to our topic for today, if you like this episode, give us a thumbs up or a like or whatever platform you're on. Give us a heart, whatever the little icon is, and keep sending in your recommendations and ideas for topics. Abby and I really love that. When you put your comments there, we really do listen and read to them, read them and listen to them. And we take all your suggestions. We read to them too. I read to those comments. I go, dear comment, I love you. And then I, I read to it. That's how, that's how much I love your comments. I read to them at night like they were one of my children. 
Okay. Anyhow, now talking about <laughs> the topic for today, Abby, what are we discussing on the Doctor is In series today? We are talking today about irrational fears and phobias. Ooh, okay. So let's start this off. What is a fear versus a phobia? Okay. So a fear is an emotional response to perceived danger. Um, when we perceive danger, we have a physiological response. Our nervous system will react to it. Um, we also have feelings of, say, dread. Um, and we have behavioral responses like fleeing or fighting. It's a very basic survival mechanism. Um, and it signals to the body that there's a threat. When we feel fear, there's a threat. Now, a phobia, on the other hand, is an extreme or irrational fear or an aversion to something. Um, and unlike a general fear, phobias are often disproportionate. Um, so you have a very disproportionate response to perceived danger. Um, and it can impact daily functioning. So fears don't really impact daily functioning. You can get on with your day. You know, you see something, say a spider, you can be scared of it, but it's not really going to impact your functioning. With the phobia, it will. Um, and phobias are a type of anxiety disorder. Um, and they can be to specific objects, situations, or environments too. So it's not just linked to, say, you know, spiders or clowns. They can be to specific environments. Okay. So I have a question based on what you just said. Um, yes. Sometimes, uh, and I've seen this, people who are afraid, let's say of snakes or spiders, they, it, it does seem to affect them because they like freeze or freak out. Like, like, you know, Rosa, she works with us. She's deathly afraid of roaches. Like, like it, 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 it paralyzes her. So is that a fear or a phobia? So it depends because it's a proportionate response, say to snakes, because snakes are an actual danger. If say for, I went for a walk recently, um, and I was just, you know, in a forest forgetting that I'm now in Florida, <laughs> not the UK. And there's a big sign that says, you know, poisonous snakes live here. Mm -hmm. And instantly I'm panicking, I'm sweating and I'm thinking, uh -huh. realizing that the grass is way too high. Um, so a proportionate response would be that fear for a snake because it is an actual danger. If she was in her bedroom thinking about the snake and she got that response, that is then um, malfunctioning. Okay. Um, and that's what happens with her, right? And for us, okay. you're listening to this, sorry to call you up, but that's what happens. Like I can just talk about a roach and she gets yes. disgusted, right? It's so not that, that it's there. That would be a, a phobia uh -huh. um, because if there is no real danger, then it's not proportionate um, because, it, again, they're designed to get us out of those dangerous situations. So roaches, even though they don't necessarily propose a danger, we can still be afraid of them and it be okay. perfectly normal. You know, most people are afraid of spiders. I am weirdly afraid of lizards and they don't really. And you live propose. here. I know. And there's lizards everywhere. And they, they, they pose no threat. Like none, like they're not poisonous. To, they'll run away from you. The only time they'll bite you is if you actually grab them. Yeah. And no chance. Yeah. I just, they're just weird to me and they don't propose a danger, but it's not abnormal if they're in my environment and I'm not going to, you know, scream and cry, but uh -huh. I still have a fear towards them. Um, is but your fear because phobia. the queen of England is also a lizard? Ah, yes. Referencing maybe. our one podcast, <laughs> right? Re theory. Referencing our conspiracy theory yeah. podcast. By the way, shameless plug. If you haven't heard that one, we have a Doctor's In series on conspiracy theories. Yes, Go that was a it. good one. That was a good one. Um, but that leads me to the question. I was going to say, do you have any real phobias? And to the audience too, have a think about, do you have any real phobias versus Oh, yeah, fears? I do. Um, clowns. I hate really? clowns. Okay. Oh, clowns. Uh, yeah. That, you know, now here's the thing. It's, it's not a paralyzing phobia. It's not a paralyzing phobia, but, um, but clowns, I just don't like them. They freak me out. I, they, I, I don't find them happy. They make me feel all weird <laughs> and like, I just don't, don't like them. And, and, and here's one that's from my child, the dark, huh. the dark. I don't like the dark. I don't like, I don't like being scared. That's right. So yes, it is. And I don't like, I don't like the dark. So, um, yeah, that's, a, and I think that's an, yeah, no, that has to be an irrational uh, phobia or fear because. So the dark you know. is an interesting one because that isn't irrational, 
a lot of people are afraid of the dark. For example, that's why they sell night lights so commonly for children, <laughs> because it's In unknown. Me. And it's natural hmm. to be afraid of the unknown because the brain wants to constantly make sure that it's safe. So okay. I can see that I'm safe. If I can't see, then I can't make that judgment whether hmm. I am 100% safe or not. So the fear of the dark is very common. Again, it really depends on the intensity of that fear. Right. You know, if <laughs> the light goes off and you scream all night, then poor yeah, that, Rita. No, that doesn't happen. And, <laughs> and then, you know, then it's just a fear and it can be a natural fear. And like I said, it's quite common. Lots of adults can't sleep unless the TV is on hmm. or there is a light on, say, in a different room and the door yeah, is open. So I'm not, that is I'm perfectly not, normal. You know what's interesting? So at home, I'm not like that. But if I go to a hotel, Mm -hmm. Um, I leave the bathroom light on because I, I, I wake up in the middle of the night and I forget where I'm at and it's all different. And then, so yeah. I need to leave the bathroom light on so I can see when I, when I, in the middle of the night. And think about up. that from a safety perspective too. You're in a new environment. Yeah. When you're at home, it's more familiar to you. You're in a new environment. So of course there's going to be a bit of a heightened awareness, um, of your, you know, sense of safety. So yeah. I, Again, it depends on the intensity, but I would say that that's pretty normal. I don't particularly mm. like the dark, um, but I'm not, I wouldn't say that I'm afraid of the dark. So I'll give you a fear. Now, not a phobia. I'm afraid of heights. And hmm. uh, it used to be really bad. Like it used to be, if I had to be near something that was high, I would get like vertigo. Like I would start like, like sh but over the last, I would say seven or eight years, I've been um, challenging myself to be on the edge of heights or to do things in heights. And I've slowly kind of worked through now. It's not that I'm not afraid at all, but like my son, like he can go up on a roof and bring a, like we had a, we had a two story roof, a three story roof at our house up North and he, we would bring a ladder and then he would bring that ladder onto the the first roof to climb onto the second roof. And I would get sweaty watching him do it. Yeah. Like, and I'd start shaking and when he, and he's the one up there. Right. And he's up there yeah. with no ropes or anything. And he's like, yeah, okay, I'll go up there and had no, no, no fear of heights. Yeah. I would get afraid watching him do it. Now I don't think I could still do that, but I've done things like where, uh, you know, we went to Colorado, we went to Pike's peak and we went all the way up 14,000 feet. And I went out to the edge of a, of a cliff just to see if I could stand there and not freak out. And, you know, it was a little freakish, but you know, <laughs> but again, it, you know, it makes sense from a survival perspective because height it's danger. It uh. could, if we slip, we fall and die. And the brain goes, no, I don't want that. That's not <laughs> going to help us. That's why fear of heights is so common. But then why is someone like Colin not afraid of heights? If we're saying that my brain is saying this is normal, then is he abnormal for not being afraid of heights? No, because we have um, control. So the prefrontal cortex can say, you know, it can make decisions and it can assess our body is saying to us, this is unsafe, but our prefrontal cortex can have a, a critical thought mm. and say, no, no, I, I know this, this is fine. And some people are just more comfortable in other situations for various reasons, you know, thrill seeking, um, you know, tendencies or previous exposure, um, goals. If their goal mm -hmm. is to have a certain kind of job or they're motivated towards something, that can override that fear. Um, the nervous system will still respond a little bit. You know, if you go too far towards a cliff, you're pushed back. That's why people that cliff jump, even they get a hesitation huh. um, because it is so natural, but it's not, it's not overwhelming. You know, fears can be controlled just like every other emotion. You know, I am, I've always been afraid of heights. So mm -hmm. I tried to kick my fear of heights by going skydiving. Huh. I'm still afraid of heights. Yeah. I would say, did you do it? Of, did, did you? Did I did you, it. Yeah. I did oh, the skydiving. You, okay. Um, I did, you know, me and Arisa flung ourselves 500 feet into the air. <sighs> that on made me so nervous watching you do that. Yep. I'm still afraid of heights. Uh huh. And I've tried exposure therapy, but I don't have a phobia of it. So okay. my fear of heights, I can go, you know, like I said, I would do bungee jumping, even though I'm afraid because I have the ability to control that emotion. Mm. Therefore, it's not a problem. It's hmm. just a natural instinct. If it was overriding my ability to control it, then it would become a phobia and then it would become maladaptive. So this is interesting because I've not, I've not done either, but um, I feel like I would 
want to skydive before I bungee jumped. Yes. It's because, the ping back. Yes, right. That's the thing. It's like pain. I'm jumping towards the ground and hoping <laughs> yeah. that this rubber band doesn't snap or break or it's not long enough or my weight isn't too much and I'm going to smack my face yeah. off of cement, yeah. right? And with skydiving, I feel like even though that's probably not true, I feel like there's a little more control. Like the first time you go, you're strapped to another human. So yeah. even if you pass out from fear, that human's going to pull the cord and you're not going to die. You know, someone who's been, done it 200 times and lived, you know, so there's like a, to me, there seems like a lot more uh, safety controls in place with skydiving than there yeah, is with bungee jumping. The brain isn't that advanced where it differentiates so much mm. um, because either you are safe or you're not. Now, critical thinking is, okay. but from that perspective of, you know, our survival instincts, the brain goes, it's safe or it's not. That's mm -hmm. why in those situations, if our body is in flight mode because it's scared, we get stomach aches. That's why a lot of people get stomach <laughs> aches because the body, when it's in flight mode, what it wants to do is make itself as light as possible to get out of that situation. Hmm. So it will increase the likelihood of vomiting. Um, wow. Which seems counterproductive to running because puking and running yeah. really doesn't go together. Yeah. And it's not just from <laughs> the top end either. It's oh. from... Things can come out. Is that out. like propulsion now? <laughs> yeah. Well, there have been reports of runners having uncomfortable <laughs> stomach situations while they're running. Yeah, I've and seen those And it's pictures. embarrassing, yeah. but it's it's a natural bodily response. That's why before an interview, a lot of the time, you're like, why am I continuously going to the toilet? Why do I feel mm -hmm. sick? It's because your body's in flight mode. It, it wants to get itself as light as possible to escape that situation. And it's halting. The process is when our body is focused on survival, it will halt unnecessary processes. And one of those is like digestion um, mm -hmm. because it's just focusing on safety. And um, that's why you can have those. And that's really natural with heights, really natural with things like, you know, certain kind of bugs, even clowns. And clowns mm -hmm. is because as a society, we have made clowns scary. Yeah. You, know, I mean, you, at, you've seen the clowns from like the 20s and 30s. They were horrific. Yeah. Yeah, they were horrific and kids loved them. And now it's like, I don't know, I see a clown and all I think of is some horror show or something. It just doesn't yeah, make and me happy. That, it's socialized. You know, if we did that with other types of entertainers, eventually we could socialize mm. those kinds of fears, too, because of exposure. Um, but that brings us nicely to, you know, how do you get phobos? Pho yeah. Phobos. <laughs> how do you get phobos? Get Phobias. Oh, so we have phobas and phobias. There's two different. I don't different... know why any of us can't speak today, Chris. So are, so are phobos um, genetic <laughs> or are they learned? <laughs> so both. Um, oh. Let's start with genetic because I, I think genetic is, you know, I understand the learning of phobias. Genetic influences are really interesting um, because there's a lot of research showing that um, phobias can be uh, inherited. Um, and we can look at that at the, by the brain's response to fear and phobias um, to certain things. Um, a parent has that neuro response and the child can have the same neuro response without learning the phobia. Um, and so there, there is evidence of a genetic influence in the development of phobias. Um, and an interesting way that they found this is through twin studies. So looking at genetically um, more identical, oh, gene not genetically identical, but identical twins who are almost genetically identical versus non-identical twins who share less of their genetics. We're more likely to see similar phobias in identical twins. Hmm. So it tells us that there is um, an inherited factor here um, because otherwise you would see the same, but because they share more of their genetics, something is obviously here in the role and it's the importance is the development of phobias too so they have a genetic vulnerability and then later in their life they can develop a phobia they're not necessarily born with it as an infant okay so this is interesting um you just like that you had so much there so i would never have thought that uh, identical twins or twins you know coming from at the same time that they would have is it, it so? Do, is it always the case they have the same phobias, or is it possible no. that they? Okay. No, so it's not always the case. Um, but twins who are identical because they share more of their genetics, they are more likely to. So when you look at the statistics of how likely non-identical and identical are, 
it's increased and identical. Whereas if there was no genetic factor, it, it, there should be no difference. But because they share more of the genetics, it says that there is obviously an increased in, increased vulnerability to. Mm. When it comes to genetics, it's like, say, you know, with eye color. Just because your parent has a particular eye color doesn't mean you're necessarily going to get that absolutely. Right. But you have the an increased genetic chance of having that. Same as, you know, if you have a parent who's a particular height, um, you know, or with a particular kind of personality um, trait, there is always an increased vulnerability or an increased likelihood, but it's never a hundred percent because one parent is only half of your genetic makeup. Uh -huh, there right. is the other half. And then our experiences also change the way that our genes express. And without getting too much into it, our microbiome, which is the bacterial ecosystem in our stomach, they affect how our genes are turned on and off. Really? Yes. Yeah, so our diet and our microbiome um, can affect our genetic expression of certain traits. That's interesting. So, okay, back to the one thing you said about learned. Uh, when, and this is going to make me sound like a terrible father, but when Amaya was <laughs> a baby, I wanted to do an experiment. Um, <laughs> You know, because like, it, like uh, my my wife is afraid of certain bugs, and you know the whole adage like you know, oh, girls are afraid mm -hmm. of bugs, and I'm like, oh, you know what? So I went to a toy store and I bought Amaya plastic insects, right? So there was like snakes and worms and and ants and and beetles and roaches and all these ins and that became her toys. So when she was very little, um, she was acclimated to picking up bugs, and they didn't they didn't freak her out, right? So we didn't. And when I told Arisa, it's like you can't come in and go. <gasps> Like you can't show the fear yeah. face when she's playing with the giant roach, right? Just let her play with it. Yep. So we did. And, and, um, it, you know, it backfired a little bit because Amaya would be one that would be outside and she'd be like picking up these giant black ants and letting them crawl on her. She'd go outside and catch snakes and then bring them in the house. And I would be like, Amaya, you have to ask first because maybe it's poisonous. She's like, no, it's fine. It didn't bite me. And I'm like, ah, <laughs> no, like that's not the way it works. But she had no fear until she got older. Right. So as a, as a, as a child, she was, she would play with any insect except here's the one thing. And this is crazy. Ladybugs freaked her out. Yeah. And there was not one ladybug in that toy kit, but ladybugs, the most harmless thing on the planet. And she would see yeah. them in our house and she would scream like they were, they were a heart, like it was a clown, right? I mean, like it was unbelievable. And yeah. as she got older, then she did start to develop fears or whatever phobias of certain insects where she doesn't do that anymore. But she still loves snakes. Yeah, the the thing is, it's that that point of um, increases the likelihood of development. So, for example, let's take schizophrenia because that is very highly uh, genetic. Now, when you have uh, schizophrenia in the bloodline, you have an increased vulnerability to it. But you can live perfectly, you know, mentally mm -hmm. well, and then it develops in later life. Just because your genetics, they lay dormant in you doesn't mean they're going to be expressed straight away. In that genetic code, it says when it's going to be released later on or something triggers it. Now, with schizophrenia, it's certain ages that it gets triggered. With phobias, it's a very similar thing where you can have the genetic vulnerability too, but you have to have either a certain trigger or it's written to be expressed at a certain time. Um, so it doesn't always show up hmm. in childhood. Things can develop as we go on for a number of reasons. Um, but also the same thing. Say you might have um, a vulnerability to have a phobia of a particular thing, but life experiences work the other way. But because of good exposure, you actually don't develop that phobia. Um, but one thing that is very likely to increase your chances of having a phobia learnt is a traumatic experience mm. related to that object. So when we have um, traumatic experiences, uh, particularly in childhood, uh, where we are most vulnerable to uh, learning associations, um, that frightening event or that object is a significant trigger for a specific phobia later on. So I'm thinking about... Who was that scientist? Was it Pavlov who did the horrible experiment with the child, like with the white bunny? Um, Watson. Watson. 
And yes, it was, so uh, well, you're thinking classical conditioning, which was Pavlov, and then operant conditioning, um, which it wasn't was Pavlov with the bunny, the white bunny, and every time the the, the kid would saw the bunny, he would clash symbols behind him. Uh, Watson, and that was the right rat. Huh. So yeah, so it was called the Little Albert Study, um, and I'm sure it was Watson in the 1920s. Yeah, I'm sure it was Watson. Oh no, and it wasn't operant conditioning. It still was classical conditioning, and I think it's because um, Pavlov was known for f- founding um, classical conditioning. Uh-huh. But this is a classical conditioning study that I don't believe Pavlov did. I believe it was after Pavlov had developed classical conditioning, and then Watson um, added this study to it. Mm-hmm. Is that correct? Um- yeah, according so in 1920s, John Hopkins professor John B. Watson was fascinated yeah. with Ivan Pavlov's research on conditioned stimulus. Pavlov rang a bell every time he fed a dog. Yeah. So, and it was a it was a bunny and and Santa Claus. So he made uh, this okay. Kid. So there are different variations of the mm-hmm. study. Um, there was one white rat, um, and there was a white rat, and it was initially a neutral stimulus. Um, it's important first we should define what classical conditioning is mm-hmm, yeah. um, before the Little Albert study. Um, so classical conditioning, as Chris rightly said, is Pavlov. And most of you know Pavlov's dog. And Pavlov will ring a bell and the dog will salivate. Now, um, with the traumatic experience, what happens is um, you have a neutral stimulus, um, say something that is not originally feared. And then it becomes associated with a traumatic event. Um, for example, if someone has been bitten by a dog, the biting of the dog will be a traumatic event and mm. the original stimulus will be the dog. And then the sight of a dog after that event, which was now a neutral stimulus, is now a conditioned stimulus because that event created fear. And now I see that original stimulus, the dog. Now I have fear. So it becomes a conditioned stimulus um, where every time I see a dog now, I'm going to feel fear. Now, with the little Albert study, like I said, there's variations, but um, a very young child named Albert was put through a really harsh study. And it's a classical study of classical conditioning, um, but it isn't a very nice study. No. Um, and little Albert was exposed to, say, a white rat, which was initially a neutral stimulus alongside a really loud and frightening noise and not just once because we've said in a previous podcast neurons that fire together wire together it's more likely to develop a phobia when it is repeated doesn't have to be but when it is repeated it really reinforces that feeling um and albert began to associate the rat with the distressing noise rather than the rat itself so every time it now saw the rat it had that feeling and now it developed a phobia to the rat. So it was a, a great example that you can trigger a phobia by teaching people to be scared of something through classical conditioning. Um, and it triggers the fear response in the brain. It's in the nervous system, in the brain, it's not just a feeling, it's a visceral response that it triggers. Um, this is just a side question. Do we ever know what happened to Albert when he grew up? Uh, I mean, I assume he probably grew up normally just afraid of white rats. Yeah, I just wonder, like, like nowadays, there would never, no ethics board would ever approve using a yeah. child for, you know, an experiment this horrific. Yeah. Like, we're going to torture this child for months and months and months so we can, you know, talk about conditioning. No ethics board's going to be like, yeah, okay, here's my kid, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, as bad as that experiment was, those studies really are foundational to our understanding of a lot of what we know about psychology. And when you go back in time, some of the most horrible studies we learn the most from, we can't do those now. But as a researcher, I know it was um, very effective. Yeah, it, it is. It's like the the study done in uh, uh, University of Pennsylvania where they, they kind of like electrocuted dogs every day. Like it's a pivotal study in understanding manipulation, but yeah. it's horrific, right? I mean, but it's almost like, wow, if we didn't do that, we might not understand a lot about certain things today. So it, it is, it's like a, like a hard thing to balance 
because half of me is like, mm-hmm. wow, I'm so glad that 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 happened in the past. But then it's like, oh, that's pretty terrible. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So back to our topic. Okay. Because I had some more questions. So we got all this. So we have genetic factors. We have tra- trauma factors. Mm-hmm. Um, and we have learned responses, right? That are all the ways that we can come with phobias. Now, what about fears? Are fears this brought about the same way? Or are those always just naturally built into us? Um, we have like innate fears. So we have fears that are related to our survival. It's very natural to be um, scared of things that could harm us. Right. That's just a survival instinct. That's why there's so many common fears. We can develop fears too in the exact same way as phobias it's just an in, it's just a reduced intensity so we can learn fears we can um and on the fact of learning there's two ways we can learn them through our own experiences but we also remember we learn through social learning mm. so we learn through observation of others right. so we can learn fears and phobias by observing other people being scared of something Say you mm-hmm. are a young child, you're learning how to interact with the world via watching your parents. Say your parents have a really, um, really intense fear of something. You learn that it's scary. You learn that that thing is bad. So you grow up thinking that thing is bad. We have this a lot with aversions to food, mm. what we eat um, when we're younger and what we see our parents eat. We learn that this is good. This is bad. And we have this with anything. And again, it's just the, the difference in intensity but we can mm-hmm. learn phobias and learn fears from parents. Parents are the best source of social learning, but we can also through peers, through non-relatives um, in the exact same way. That reminds me of the study done by uh, Joseph Campos um, with the um, the visual cliff where he created that, that yes. table. And then the mom was on the other side of the cliff yep. and she can only do one of two things. It was either real happiness or real fear. Yeah, And it was amazing to watch that video and see the same baby, like the same exact baby stopping yeah. right at the cliff if there's fear, but going right across this cliff if there's if there's happiness. Like it's just that yeah. to me really solidified like how, uh, yes, as parents, we are so responsible for how our children view fears and, and things like that. And it's interesting, the same is with animals, actually. Hmm. Um, so when there is, say, a loud noise, Often your pets, especially cats, will look to you to see how you react. Um, and if you panic, you I don't know if you've ever seen cats panic, um, but they no, go. I, my son has a cat, but I, I, I don't. Well, they can just go crazy. Like They can puff up and just run in circles and create chaos. Wow. And if you panic, and it depends also on the relationship between you and your pet, A lot of people have very strong relationships with cats Mm -hmm. and dogs, even horses. And they're very in tune to your emotions, almost in the same way that humans are um, and your children are. So you can panic and create panic with the animals as well. I I saw um, a a study that talked about how horses have similar nonverbal centers in their brains that, that humans do. Interesting. For, for reading, I'll find it and send it to you. But it was uh, it was talking about how like horses, like you said, the ho- like cats and dogs, mm. but and horses are very good at reading facial expressions, and that yeah. they found that horses have a similar center for reading nonverbals. Of course, not as that not as complex as humans, you know, where they understand contempt and disgust and all that. But you know, the the, the base emotions they definitely get that, and they're very connected to their humans. Yeah, and um. People underestimate the impact of the relationship between pets and people. It's like cats can have uh, nearly 300 facial expressions. There was a study done showing how specific they can show different emotions and how complex their facial muscular it, musculature is to communicate because they, um, they domesticated themselves. Hmm. So they have you know, evolved in a way that is purposeful to communicate with humans. So they have this really advanced communication system. And I don't know too much about horses, but what is interesting about horses is there were studies done showing that prisoners who got to interact with horses had um, better behavioral and mental health outcomes. Yeah, because horses (laughs) are really in tune with people too. So it's not just on a nonverbal perspective, but, you know, bringing it back to fears, 
we are connected to our pets. So we can teach them things are good and things are bad, um, as well as communicate with them non-verbally. Hmm. That's, that's, I mean, you, you know, there's, I saw a lot of studies like on things like uh, putting a dog in an old person's home um, helped the old people live longer. Like something yeah. about this animal human connection that like just yeah. having something to pet or something to love could do something for your life. You know, it's, it's, it's kind yeah. of amazing. Yeah. So when you're, um, when you're lonely, having a connection with a, a pet can have the same neurochemical response as having a connection with a human. It, mm. it can provide a sense of nurturing women that can't have children, but want children. If they have pets, it can provide that sense of nurturing again, biologically as well as psychologically. And it creates that same companionship. That's why people, a lot of the time, you know, we joke and say our pets are our kids, but they feel like your children, huh. you know, in a, a very, very biological way. It's not just, you know, people do go a little bit wild with their pets. <laughs> oh, but who, I, who, who are you thinking I, of? I, I cannot think of anyone. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm having a real hard time coming up with a name. I knew this person once, um, Abby. Abby. Yeah, they're my kids. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> but on that, so um, during... I think it was new year's eve it was my first new year's eve in florida and in florida they're very big on fireworks oh yeah yes very very big on fireworks America. where i lived back in the uk <laughs> there wasn't a much there wasn't much noise my house is quite out of the way it's not super you know in the middle mm -hmm. of a busy area so when the fireworks started to go off both my cats looked at me and I stayed calm mm -hmm. and it was just calmness. But previously in my old house, I had, you know, gone sat with them and I'm like, it's okay, uh -huh. it's okay. And they're, they're panicking. So yeah. I just stayed very calm. It was a very uh -huh. new environment and there was no panic at all. They just looked at me. I looked at them. It's like, it's fine. And then everything was fine. Hmm. So what we do tend to do is make things worse a lot of the uh, time yep. with pets, with kids, yep. because when we have a fear or something is scary, we panic yeah, and then we teach them this thing is scary. If we yep. try and maintain emotional control, they will then, um, it will reduce the association of fear yeah. and that thing. We would do that with Amaya when she would fall, when she was a little, you yeah. know? and she'd scrape her knee and be like, it's okay. It's just a little bit. Right. And then she would realize, oh, it's not that bad. Right. And then yeah. when she did cry, we knew, okay, this is serious. Like she got hurt. Something is bad. Right. Because yeah. we were, like, we weren't like, you know, call the helicopter because she got a splinter, you know, <laughs> as and much as really I wanted to, to do you know? as a parent, because yeah, really you know, a, a kid will hurt themselves and you often what you see is the kid is fine. Yeah. And then the parents are, are you okay? You're great. And then yeah. they go, yeah. And they start bringing out because they realize, oh no, this is bad. This is scary. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so they have learned like this is, this is a scary thing. And I can also yeah. get some attention and nurturing yep. if I have a reaction, which will reinforce it because now I got some attention and nurturing when I reacted. So I'm going to do it again. So again, neurons that wire together, fire together. Hmm. We're now more likely to show that response. But the good news is, even if you do have a phobia, just like we said about fears, you can get rid of them. If you have a phobia, whether it's been inherited or learned, you're not stuck with that phobia for the rest of your life. There are things that you can do to absolutely remove that phobia. That It's just difficult because you have to unwrite a pattern. So I know for me, like I said before, with the heights, it was exposing myself to heights in a safe manner, right? Like not not doing anything unsafe, but get, you know, making sure that I was still safe, but slowly going into places that I would normally make me very nervous. Yes. And, you know, like we, we went on the, uh, that big Ferris wheel in Orlando. It's like one of the highest in the world and it's all glass. Right. And then when you get to the yeah. very top standing at the spot where the bottom is glass, I'm looking straight down. And the first time I did that, it was like, you know, I'm, waving back and forth, but you do that a couple of times. And also I was like, okay, I'm safe. My brain went, you didn't die. It worked out okay. So besides yeah. exposure, what else can you do to, to get rid of a phobia? So the best way to reduce a phobia is CBT, so cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, but exposure therapy is a great way. Um, the best ones, I mean, sometimes medication can help. 
Mm. But the best ways are CBT and exposure therapy. Um, so CBT is uh, changing thought patterns. So it's identifying and challenging negative thoughts. So as we go into a situation, our beliefs about what's going to happen will change how we interact with it and change how we react to it. Mm -hmm. So CBT will identify that thought pattern and then it will try and swap those thoughts with more rational and balanced thoughts. And again, you know, changing thought patterns is difficult because you have yeah. a learned association. So each time you put in a new association, you have to undo one and put a new one. And then again, next time undo and redo. So it mm. takes time and it takes patience and exposure therapy. It's really important not just to throw someone with a phobia <laughs> in that situation yeah. where they have Here's no a pit evidence of snakes. Yeah. <laughs> right. People will go crazy with it, with yeah, um, yeah. exposure therapy. And I've seen people promoting like, do these really extreme things to get over your fear. Like I did that with my skydiving, but I was, it was my choice and I was in a controlled environment. Whereas some people promote, you know, do this thing that you're terribly afraid of and you'll get over it. And it, it doesn't quite work that way. What that can do sometimes is reinforce the fear. If we're pushed into it and we're saying, no, 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 it's safe, just do it but they don't feel safe yeah that fear can reinforce the phobia make it much stronger what you imagine. want to do yeah and it, it, over time is the key there right. so what you want to do is slowly introduce it so if you are afraid of spiders i'm not going to lock you in a room <laughs> filled with spiders and right. go good get out yeah. and then you'll be good yeah. what i'm going to do is i'm going to expose you but slowly i'm going to put you in an environment you feel really really safe i'm going to bring a cage with a spider in it, and I'm not gonna get the spider out of the cage. You're just, you are in the environment with the spider, mm -hmm. the spider can't touch you. And then slowly I'll move the cage closer to you. And then slowly what I'm gonna do is, you know, put it near you and then put it on your hand. But it's gonna be over time. And during that environment, I'm going to make sure you feel safe. Mm -hmm. So those feelings of safety will translate into that interaction bit after bit after bit. And that's the, the really important bit. It sounds like what's important also is that it's your choice. Yes. Right. Like, like in your yeah. case, you did something extreme, but it wasn't because yeah. your friend or your father or one of your sisters forced you into it. It wasn't like, Hey, you're going to get yeah. over your fear of heights and they threw you on a plane. It's like, it was your choice to do it. Right. So yeah. that, that sounds um, like a really important part of getting over the phobia. Yeah. Because it's about safety. Yeah. So when we feel we don't have a choice, we don't feel in control, which is a natural state of not feeling safe mm -hmm. because it's it's unpredictable. Um, so it really is important that you choose to. You can't force people into not being scared of things anymore. You can't brute force someone out of a phobia. Right. It's just going to make it worse. Um, and what you can do during things like exposure therapy is you want to create a relaxing environment. So... Um, some really effective techniques are to use relaxation techniques, mm. like say sound baths or relaxing music, or if people like being spoken to in a certain way, you know, using a relaxing tone whilst doing exposure therapy, because it helps curb that nervous system response. That makes they sense. They can start to associate the feeling of relaxation with that response. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Oh, and interestingly, now with the use of technology, we've started to do virtual reality oh. exposure therapy. Yeah, mm. really interesting. That, see, that's so, fa that's fascinating to me because when when I remember when like when VR headsets first came out for like let's say the PlayStation, mm -hmm. we got one, and they had this experience where you're underwater, and you know you have the headphones in, you have the sight in, all you have is haptics on your hands, but it did feel like you were going up and yeah. down in this shark cage. And it, and the sounds and that, you know, you're not wet, but it did feel and the first time, like a shark bumps the cage on the side and you look over and it's right there. It does scare you a little yeah. right? because it, it felt too real, but your but your yeah. head sank, but you're not wet. You're not in the water, you know, and that they're so immersive. They're very, very realistic now. Yeah. And think about how good that is for exposure therapy of things that you don't want to put someone in a situation right. where it could be unsafe, like snakes. Yeah. I don't want to bring a snake in. And also, where am I going to get a snake sometimes? Right. But you can use those exposure therapies in a controlled environment. You know, I'm not going to throw, say you have a, a phobia of sharks mm -hmm. and the phobia affects your daily functioning. You won't go into pools 
and you think about it and you get the sweats and you panic while you're in your bedroom. My exposure therapy, I'm not going to put you in a, a pool with sharks, but it still affects your daily functioning. So having virtual reality where you can do that now is really, really yeah. exciting. Yeah, that is exciting. That's that's kind of fascinating. Okay. Well, this has been a good discussion. I think it will be helpful for a lot of people because, I mean, even for me, um, I might, I don't think I clearly understood the difference between phobias and fears before we had this discussion. And sometimes I think it's easy to mix those words up yes. and then get confused. Yes. And a lot of people will say they have a phobia when they just have a strong fear. Uh-huh, yeah. And when we do that, what it kind of does is undermine the reality of phobias. We do mm-hmm. that with a lot of clinical terms. Um, things like we overuse the word narcissist Mm. and what it does is undermine true victims experiences. Um, and it's the same with phobias because I, I have a phobia of wasps, a Uh really strong phobia of wasps. Mm -hmm. Um, I was stung when I was very young and they stung me on my eye. And if it had been just millimeters to the side, it it could have blinded my eye. So eyeball. Yeah. Oh yeah. my, I've never even so, heard no, it somebody. got me on the skin, oh. like right next to my eye. So almost touching my actual eyeball and it could have been really bad. Yeah. When a wasp will come into my environment, I won't just feel a bit scared. I get the sweat. I panic. I right, right. I would cry when I was a kid if there was a wasp anywhere, you know, there's a wasp by the table. Yeah. I couldn't sit still. And my mom would be like, Oh, stop. And I'm sweating and I'm crying. Yeah, yeah. And she's like, oh, just stop, stop. And it's really distressing. Mm-hmm. And that is that will affect my functioning. If I'm trying to have a meeting and there's a wasp in the room, yeah. I, I have to get out because I'm no use to anybody in that meeting. Huh. And when people say oh, I have a phobia, when it is a fear, it really does undermine yeah. that experience. And it also creates a culture where we're less understanding mm. on the issue. So we're less able to help people get over those phobias. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I'll, I'll include myself as a lay person and, and that we, sometimes we hear the words and then it's easy to misuse them, right? To think that yeah. someone is this who's truly arrogant as a narcissist, but not seeing that there's a huge difference between being arrogant and being yeah. a clinical narcissist, right? Not, someone can have narcissistic traits and not be categorized as a narcissist, yes, right? So absolutely. I think that's a, that's an interesting, maybe that's a topic for another podcast. Absolutely. There we are. See, we always do this. Come up with something good at the end, right? Okay. Well, Doc, um, another great episode. Um, let's see who, who, what's happening next month? Cause I think we have a really, really exciting podcast for next month. Yes, we do. I'm very excited for this one. We have David Matsumoto yeah. on our podcast. Yeah, uh, anyone who studies nonverbals will know the name. Um, We're going to be talking about emotions, culture, um, his research. I don't want to give too much away because you've got to tune in to listen. But I already know that it's going to be a great one. Yeah. Uh, He has some research that I've been wanting to talk to him about for a decade. So I'm very excited to finally get to meet him and have him on the show. It It will be excellent. Well, thank you again for another great episode and doing all the research. Uh, as always, everybody, the the, uh, the show notes will include all of the papers that uh, Dr. Abby has pulled up to help us with getting the uh, the talking points for this episode. So if you're interested in reading any of them, there's a, a, a ton of them there. Um, you can uh, follow both of us on social media. All of our links will be in the show notes. And we really hope you enjoyed this episode as much as we enjoyed talking about it. Until next month, stay safe and secure. See you.